Hello everyone and happy Friday. Today is August 22nd and this is episode 5 of our Google Hangouts and podcast on all things Doxis. I'm Brady Volpe, founder of the Volpe Firm and Nimble This. My guest is John Downey, consulting engineer at Cisco Systems. John, it's so good to have you back. You add so much enthusiasm and depth of knowledge to our podcast, so it's, it's really good to have you, John. Hey, thanks. I, I feel like a recurring guest. Yeah, <laughs> at, at, what point, at what point am I not a guest anymore? Yeah, I don't know. It'd be the, the John, and Downey, John and Brady show here. So. <laughs> <laughs> Mike and Mike in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. So, so today, you know, we, we had an awesome show last time. Today, we're going to be talking again, more things Doxis. Uh, we'll be covering some T3 and T4 timeout issues. We'll talk about the upcoming cable tech, SETE Cable Tech Expo in Denver. And we'll cover some things about Doxis 3.1. You know, so how, what is it? How do we prepare for it? Everyone's talking about Doxis 3.1. It'll be a big topic at SCT Expo. Uh, if you have questions, as always, uh, you know, if you're watching this live, please post your questions directly to the live broadcast by clicking the Q&A button. And uh, it should be in your upper right-hand corner of the, of the Hangout window that you're looking at. And uh, we'll get to those questions as they come up. Uh, if you're following us on the Volpe Firm blog. You can catch all of our past Hangouts and uh, and watch those. And we also are posting those now to the iTunes Store, so you can uh, just do a search on Doxis. We're pretty much the only thing out there on iTunes on Doxis. So you'll be able to, to uh, catch up on us and and download the podcasts on Doxis uh, uh, or on, on iTunes and and uh, listen to us as you're going on. So. Uh, you know, I like to talk about what's new, and one of the things uh, that caught my eye, I'm always intrigued by sort of, as what we say is the Netflix effect, and Lightman Research came out with some, some new statistics that they're claiming there are 49,915,000 broadband users in the country, which they say is just squeaking ahead of the 49,910,000 who, uh, subscribers to cable TV, so that they're basically saying there's 5,000 more subscribers to broadband than there are to cable TV, and of course they're saying, well, you know, some of those broadband users subscribe to both cable TV and 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 Doxis, so they're they're doing with both. But what their their main point is, uh, a lot of these broadband subscribers are cutting the cord. Uh, you know, cord cutters. So they're they're really starting to drop video, and Doxis is becoming the main way they're getting their video. And so, the the crux of the issue is, you know, data is really starting to rule, and it's starting to become the major thing uh, that is is the revenue piece for cable operators out there. And we're starting to see a lot of that. Um, so it's it's driving the need for speed. It's Kind of why we're looking at Doxis and other ways to get in, to get video. So, John, I want to see if if you're seeing you know kind of that same trend uh, from your customers. John can't hear you. I think uh, you're on mute. There we go. There we go. <laughs> yeah. <I'm up>. yeah. <laughs> so uh, we talked about this last time where we don't want to be a dumb dumb pipe, and if we are, then we're going to lose. Um, money and revenue to Netflix, Hulu TV, and over-the-top video. So we started offering, even Cisco came out with this thing called uh, Videoscape, which was kind of the solution or answer to that, where the MSOs would provide their own over-the-top with a better quality of service. It's hard to guarantee a quality of service or quality of experience for over-the-top Netflix and Hulu TV and stuff like that. My concern, and we talked about this last time, was over-the-top video is not streaming video. It's really a TCP-based application where it's kind of like downloading a file, buffering it, and you know start watching as the rest of the video starts buffering and filling in your, your cache or whatever. Um, but it's it's requiring upstream acknowledgments to keep that downstream flow going. So this downstream traffic is creating more upstream traffic. Uh, it's not a whole lot, but there are some things we find that are helping. Uh, maybe act suppression might help a little bit. Um, but when I start having all of these downstream flows, inevitably I'm going to have more small upstream acknowledgments, which also have a lot of overhead. So I start filling up my upstream pipes, and that's why we have to go to upstream bonding and things like that. Um, I, I, I see the same 
the same uh, pattern like you're talking about, where I think it's the younger generation, right? <laughs> They're starting to find out that they want to be able to watch whatever on their their notepad, on their iPhone, uh, in their room, or whatever on their Xbox, but via IP video, you know. And it might just be Hulu TV or Netflix or something like that. Um, it'll, there'll be a day when these kids won't know what an what a commercial is. You know, we're all getting spoiled with DVR capabilities and things like that. We just skip over all the app, the, the advertising. You know, I'm going on a segue, but you know what's going to happen is it's going to be more embedded advertising, which you see now, where you see a Coke can in the middle of the uh, the TV show. Like you're watching 24, you'll see a Cisco security IP routing stuff in the in the TV in the application or in the. So you're going to see like embedded advertising. Where you yeah. can't get away from it. <laughs> yeah, I definitely think the model's changing a lot more. I mean, advertisers are becoming much more aware that we're not watching a lot of commercials, even whether we're getting it through linear programming or you know that we've recorded DVR or we're getting it over the top because we, you know, it's 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 really painful to watch commercials. So we we find a, a way to get by them, one way or another. But um, I mean, your 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 points on on whether there's impairments in a plant or whether there's some type of you know uh, traffic over utilization are, are really key and um, you know back to the impairment point I had a, a customer that uh, sent in a question that's that's really I think kind of key to understanding what impairments are and uh, the customer's question was you know they, they got an emergency email this week telling me that they had a lot of trouble tickets being generated every day due to T3 error problems and they said, you know, some of these were clustered in endpoints, some of them were not clustered in endpoints, and their, their struggle is trying to figure out, uh, you know, the, whether or not the, the T3, in, in some places, they could see, oh, it's, it's bad SNR. So they said, okay, well, this, this is, makes sense. But in other places, the T3 timeouts, they had no bad SNR on the upstream. So they're really trying to understand, you know, what, what exactly are T3 timeouts and, and in other cases they saw T4 timeouts and I you know so so I, I write about this on my blog T3 and T4 timeouts and it's probably one of the the biggest questions I get uh, or the it's the most looked at article on, on, on my site what are T3 and T4 timeouts I, I think this is something that is, is really important for people to understand because they see them all the time on modem logs they see them on on error reports and it's still confusing to people Almost like the most misunderstood timers. <laughs> yeah, yes. um, you know, I, I worked with uh, an MSO that used to track the T3, T4 timers. And let's keep in mind that these are in the modem. These are not the CMTS. These are modem timers. And, and I'll explain what they really are. But one, the one customer MSO I had was tracking the modem T3 timers, and they equated a lot of T3 timeout errors to voice problems. They didn't really notice it with best effort customers because the best effort would usually resend. But voice is real time. So when they had a lot of T3, they started having more voice issues and they, had a made, a, they made a correlation there. So uh, the modem has a T4 timer that's typically 30 seconds. Uh, that is part of, my analogy is a three-way handshake between the cable modem and CMTS. The CMTS is keeping track of four things now. It used to be three, but now it's four. It's levels upstream levels, upstream timing, uh, upstream frequency, and also pre q taps. So every time we do station maintenance, uh, which is every 15 to 20 seconds per modem, we are looking at its upstream level, plus or minus one from wherever we set the CMTS to, normally zero. So it's outside that window, we want to tell the modem to readjust its level. Frequency should not be moving, unless a crystal oscillator or something's wrong in the modem, why would your frequency be shifting, right? Um, timing is a big one. Timing is one that I've seen cause issues on the upstream where the CMTS is trying to schedule many slots and it's not working and it turns out it looks like an upstream problem but the MER is good, the CNR looks perfectly fine because CNR is just a spectrum analyzer, peak to peak, so you don't really know what you're looking at but it turns out to be a timing issue with the modem because it might be uh, incrementing its time offsets. So there's cases where I've seen the modulation profile is bad. The preamble of the initial maintenance and station maintenance is not correct. And the Broadcom chipset and the CMTS doesn't train on it correctly or enough time uh, to actually train correctly and your MER actually fluctuates. So we usually have recommended mod profile settings. Uh, I look at my modem time offsets to make sure they're not incrementing in time over days. 
I had a modem that was physically about 20 miles of fiber away. Three weeks later, it looked like it was 100 miles away when I did the correlation to the distance and the time offset. And it didn't make any sense. So it's basically throwing everybody else off as well. So there's some things I'll start tracking. Now, if you don't have the luxury of looking at a modem's T3 and T4 timers because you don't have access to the modem logs, in the CMTS, at least for Cisco, there's the flap list. And the flap list, I tell people, if you look at the misses in the flap list, that can be equated to T3 timeouts in the cable modem. So if you have a lot of misses to hit ratio, a hit would be a successful three-way handshake. Cable modem says, change your level. Modem changes its level. CMTS says, OK, that's a three-way handshake. If that's successful, you'll get a hit in the flap list, assuming the modem's already in the flap list for some reason. So I'll see a hit every 15 to 20 seconds. But if I start seeing three, four, five misses for every one hit, you're starting to hit the threshold of when you should start suspecting an upstream issue. T3 timeouts and misses on the flap list usually indicate upstream issues. If I have enough of those, 16 in a row, uh, you're going to get a T4 timeout because the CMTS is going to say, hey, I've been trying to talk to you 16 times in a row. I'm going to quit talking to you so no downstream sync messages. Uh, and the modem will eventually time out and start scanning downstream again. So the T4 timer is critical because once that goes, the modem scanning downstream. It goes offline. The T3 timer, you can afford a couple hits here and there. But once you get four or five, six hits in a row in, a, say, a 15-second window or a station maintenance window, that's when I start getting worried. And usually that indicates upstream noise, upstream timing, maybe the mod profile is bad, things of that nature. Okay. So, I mean, it sounds like you're breaking this down in a couple of, of areas that we could, one maybe easily actionable, one not easily actionable. We get uh, T3 timeouts because we have some type of upstream impairment. And so, I mean, we can take that and we can start looking for those upstream impairments. The other one sounds a lot more complex where we have T3 timeouts and this could be because we have something, uh, as you said, you know, Broadcom chipset related, preamble related, modulation profile related. This involves, uh, you know, someone to to maybe look at the CMTS, look at the the running config. How do we differentiate between that, and how does a cable operator know where to look in in that case? I, I mean, the first thing is uh, like a config audit and just like throw in the config to their TAC engineer or their support structure. You know, I don't scale very well, so I don't want everyone sending me their configs. <laughs> you know, we have proper channels to say, all right, um, I work for Comcast. Um, I assume Comcast knows what they're doing, but Comcast has an, a sales engineer from Cisco and it's like, hey, is this really the right profile we're supposed to be running? And I might make some suggestions. In the background, when we turn on pre-equalization, a lot of times the preambles will change automatically. So even if they didn't statically or manually set the preamble in the mod profile, the CMTS will override it anyway. So there are some cases where your preamble might not be set correctly, but with pre-EQ on, it actually sets it anyway for you. So there's, we might be hiding things behind the curtain a little bit. Um, but usually I'll look at someone's uh, config and do a quick config audit and say, well, that's not really the mod profile I would recommend, and that might be one of the problems. And then I also might recommend, let's look at your time offsets to your modems over time and see if they're changing. I know in our CMTS, Cisco CMTS, we can do a show cable modem verbose command, and you can see current time offset and initial time offset. So what we're doing is now we're tracking the modem's time offset when it registers and, and what it is right now. And if that's off by more of 5, 10 ticks, time offset ticks, then obviously it's incrementing and it shouldn't be. It's not physically moving unless you, you did physically move it somehow. <laughs> but if you physically moved it, it would probably go offline, right? So if it went offline, it would have a different initial time offset again. Um, but what I'm seeing is modems that are um, every 20, 15 to 20 seconds station maintenance, a time offset plus two, minus one, plus two, minus one, plus two, minus one, plus two, minus one. So you see the pattern just keeps going up and up and up and up and up. And I'm seeing some modems increment. That used to be bad firmware in the modems. A lot of them have been uh, identified, but there still could be some out there. Okay. So, yeah, time offsets. Um, so, I mean, you can't just rely on a spectrum analyzer and MER readings. You know, it, it could be timing issues. It could be mod profile issue. Um, I even had a problem with upstream bonded modems going into upstream partial mode showing up in the flap list with a lot of misses 
and it turned out it was a timing issue there. I was trying to be too aggressive with my map advance, and if I had my map advance lower than 2300, so I was manipulating a lot of settings, map advance safety, uh, something called DEPI, uh, converged inner network delay. Um, I was manipulating some numbers to try to get faster request grant cycle for 2.0 modems to get better upstream speed. And I made it so good, and the fiber was only one mile long and not 20 miles long, that my map advance was actually too quick which sounds crazy. Normally, I want my map advance as quick as possible so my two modems can do request grant, request grant on the upstream and get better per modem upstream speed. But I was too aggressive. So now I found that if I keep my map advance above 2300 microseconds, that's 2.3 milliseconds, I'm not having any problems with upstream bonding partial mode. So here's a case where upstream bonding partial mode, you would think it's an RF problem, and it wasn't. It was a timing problem. Right. So, I mean, I think the, the important thing that we, we want people to take away from this is, you know, first of all, we're understanding that the T3, T4 timers, those are, those are timers in the cable modems. And so if, if you get 15 or 16 T3 timeouts, that's when you get the T4 timeouts. A lot of times we generally say T3 timeouts are an indication, oftentimes, of some sort of upstream impairment. But, you know, a lot of times there are more complicated things that can be going on behind the scenes in the CMTS that it's not always going to be an RF-related issue, and you may have to dig deeper. You may have to, again, as John said, you may have to work with your TAC engineer or someone that can help do an audit. It may be within your organization to make sure that, you know, it's, it's not a physical layer problem. It could be something more complex. What about this? What about laser clipping? What if you start turning on more upstream frequencies for bonding? Obviously, you're putting more power into the upstream laser. And then you also have ingress, which is power. So you cause laser clipping. Laser is going in nonlinear region, and it's shutting off for brief amounts of time. Best effort probably will survive, right? Because best effort will resend. Voice, you're going to have issues. Station maintenance, you might drop a few here. So you could end up with a lot more misses. But just something to think about, right? Could be yep. upstream laser clipping. So, oh, one, uh, more <laughs> one more thing. One more thing. One more thing. This is a good one that people might not understand. And we may have brought this up because I always forget what the heck we talked about last time. And, <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's this one saying that if you teach somebody uh, a topic, they only remember about 25% of it. But if you keep repeating it over and over again, they'll eventually pick up 75% of it. So right. I just keep repeating myself, and eventually people will pick it all up. <laughs> as long as I repeat myself and don't change this change the uh, the answers <laughs> so the at least for Cisco CMTS how do I want to uh, approach this delicately the modems timers 30 seconds but if you have four upstreams doing upstream bonding do you really need to do station maintenance for every upstream every 30 seconds you just quadrupled the amount of station maintenance on the CMTS because you're sending station maintenance to one modem four times. So by default, we have a T4 multiplier in the CMTS. So if you turn on four-channel upstream bonding, the multiplier will be four. What this means is the modem's T4 multiplier will, will be four times 30 is 120 seconds. So let me give you an example. And people in the, in the field are seeing this and they're like scratching their head saying, I pulled the RF cable from the modem and it stayed on downstream lock for two minutes straight. And they're like, how can that be? And I'm like, it's a T4 multiplier. The 30-second timer is multiplied by four. That's two minutes. So it's a lot faster to pull the, the AC power to the modem and reset it and plug it back in than to pull the RF because the T4 multiplier is kind of screwing people's heads up. And they're like, what's going on here? And if we ever do A-channel bonding, look out, right? Eight times 30, that's what, 240? Time, that's four minutes. <laughs> so a modem could actually stay there. LED for downstream is lit and locked while you pull the RF cable, and in four minutes you're just sitting there waiting for this modem to reset and start scanning downstream again. Right, and the same thing happens with pre when we're doing uh, proactive network maintenance. You know, with, if a cable modem has just one upstream, that, that equalizer is getting adjusted once every 20 seconds in the cable modem, but as you go... If you put two upstreams on, and now it's getting adjusted once every 40 seconds, and you know, as you say, it just it, it continues to increase the amount of time that the equalizers are getting adjusted. The more upstreams that you put on, 
So we, we see that delay happen. But and that and that but that pre equalization is per upstream channel, right? So we're, we right. basically have to look at each individual upstream channel. You know, that brings up another point. Someone asked me if I do five to eighty five megahertz for Doxis three three O even, um, does the modem there's more spectrum five to eighty five and the coax cable is going to be more lost at higher frequency. We just doubled it, right, from five to forty two to eighty five. And will the modem have enough range and can it compensate for the tilt? And the first question they came up with, and I think it was their misunderstanding, can pre-EQ make up for this tilt? I mean, keep in mind, pre-EQ is a per-channel allocation, right? It's not across the board. You don't have a channel that takes up the whole spectrum unless we go to DOCSIS 3.1. That's a different story. Right. So pre-EQ will make up for, I've seen 5 to 10 dB of tilt in the 6.4 megahertz channel, which is impressive. But you should never have that much tilt in one channel, right? Unless it's roll off. If you have the roll off of say 585, then of course maybe you have some roll off. The pre EQ will make up for it. But 585, when we have temperature swings, we're going to see potentially. Say I balance out my upstream perfectly flat. If it gets really cold out, we could see a 8 dB tilt. And the, the thought process is we might have to start looking at reverse thermal EQs if we have long amplifier cascades. Maybe when we go 585, we'll be two amp cascades and not five. You know, but depending on the amount of coax cable, doing 585, it's going to be a big swing in the tilt, but the modems do have a 12 dB dynamic range. So I could have one upstream channel at, at 80 megahertz at plus 50 and one channel at 10 megahertz at 40. That's a 10 dB delta, but I could still bond those two channels. And then any channels in between, obviously. So the concern there would be the pre-EQ will make up for an individual channel and roll off, but the dynamic range can make up for the difference in level between channels. And, and the other thing that you have to contend with is the temperature swing that you're exactly. going to have. It, uh, uh, because these don't have, in, in, amplifiers in return don't have an automatic gain control like you do in the forward path. So uh, typically at 42 megahertz, we see, what, a plus or minus 3 dB change over temperature. So what would you expect to see at 85 megahertz w over uh, a temperature change of, uh, you know... You know, in, what, was, what was interesting is uh, we have a, uh, an engineer at Atlanta, uh, Sugarloaf office, the old SA campus, and they just did a cascade test under, in the temperature chamber. And uh, it was interesting is the cold side had more of a swing than the warm side. I think it was uh, plus 60 degrees Celsius and minus 40 degrees Celsius or something like that. But the, plus, the, the cold side swung almost 8 dB and at 85 megahertz, and the warm side swung 4 dB. So normally at 40 megahertz, I'm seeing a plus to minus 3 dB swing, but it's getting more prevalent on the cold side. So what that means is what I foresee happening, if we don't use reverse equalize, thermal equalizers, I could foresee when it gets cold out, the modem's going to, the CMTS is going to tell the modem to change its level to hit the CMTS at zero, which is fine. If it's colder out, less attenuation, the modem will change its level lower, which is okay. But what's going to happen is, if less attenuation in the coax, your noise floor is going to go like this. Going to get really bad. Your your normally our noise floor is high on the low end. When it gets cold out, I think it's going to start shifting. Yep. Which a reverse equalizer, a thermal EQ, would actually bring that back down again. Do you understand? Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> it's a 12 dB swing. That's a lot of that's a lot yeah. of swing at 85 megahertz. Yeah. Yeah. So it's. So I think, you know, you talk about we don't have level, automatic level control in the upstream, but that's what we relied on the modem to do, right? Long loop level control. The modem will change its levels. That's why we tell people, you know, don't let the modem transmit more than, say, 50 dBmV nor during normal temperature because you want to leave yourself some headroom. Well, four-channel upstream bonding is only 51 dBmV, so we're saying don't let the modem transmit more than 48. Give yourself 3 dB of headroom so when it gets hot out, we'll still have some reserve left. But if we go to 8-channel bonding, I had a modem at 8-channel bonding, the max transmit was 48. Hopefully, those newer modems will implement the ECN, the engineering change request, ECR, ECN, whatever it was, from cable labs that give extended upstream power. So I had a new one, a 32 by 8 modem, that is now doing 54 dBmV, 8-channel bonding, 64 qualm. 
that gave me 6 dB more than what the spec originally said. Actually, there really was no spec for 8-channel bonding. The spec was always for 4-channel upstream bonding. Sure. So, okay, so on to uh, SCT Expo. Uh, I'm going to be there. You're going to be there, John. Um, on Monday, there's a symposium. I, I hope uh, some folks are able to attend that. Uh, in the morning, there's going to be talking about Wi-Fi. In the afternoon, it'll be DOCSIS 3.1. Uh, I'll be speaking in the afternoon talking about proactive network maintenance and, and how it applies to DOCSIS 3.1. There's a, a, whole, a whole gambit of new hooks that are in, in the 3.1 specification uh, on PNM. Uh, but, uh, and, and we'll cover, we'll cover if, you don't, if you're not going to uh, K Expo, we'll have a whole uh, a hangout about Expo after Expo. But uh, uh, the PNM or the uh, uh, 3.1, you know, everyone's talking about that. What's the big deal about 3.1? The big reason 3.1 is coming is is really more bandwidth in the downstream and the upstream, and we're accomplishing that by doing 4096 QAM in the downstream using OFDM or orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. We have a new uh, uh, encoder in it that uh, allows us to recover bits that are corrupted due to impairments, and then in the upstream we're doing 1024 QAM, uh, also using OFDM, and you know a lot of people are concerned. How do how are we going to do 4096 QAM in the downstream, 1024 QAM in the upstream? I think this is crazy, um, but it, it is possible using the the new Reed Solomon or the, the new LDPC uh, encoder. And uh, you know, John, I think we were talking earlier. You said we're basically with the same any MER, we can do 1024 QAM. As, as we can 256 QAM in the downstream. Uh, but there are things that we can start doing now to get ready for DOCSIS 3.1. Even if you're not lo even looking at DOCSIS 3.1 in the next couple of years, it's, it's just general plant maintenance and improvements that you can do to, to start improving your plant even with the existing network that you have. Yeah, I, uh, so on to uh, SCT Expo. Um, if I can see my shirt. <laughs> so let me do a plug right there for the IP challenge. Monday, I think it's five or six, uh, Cisco is sponsoring with uh, SCTE the IP challenge. We've been doing it for a few years now where uh, people try during the whole year with some testing and it's a Jeopardy type of test and an IP challenge. And so it tests your DOCSIS knowledge and routing, splitting or routing, switching type of knowledge. Um, and yeah, and, you know, even if you even if you don't participate in the challenge, it's a lot of fun to go and watch the IP challenge because you'll learn a lot, and and, yeah, yeah. and just watching it, you learn a lot of good information. So I do recommend going and attending, even if you're not a participant. You know, what's interesting is normally we kind of overlapped a little bit with Acturna JDS uses opening reception. I don't think they're sponsoring an opening reception this year. Really? That's I didn't see anything, which is interesting, huh. but. Well, we'll have food there too, and I think beer or whatnot. Uh, so yeah, we'll have, have a both. good time. We'll have a we'll have a good time. But I'm hoping to get into your session, the the symposium. It's after lunch, right? For the yeah. three one, yeah. uh, and it's you, John Chapman, and um, uh, George Salinger. George Salinger, yes. All right. So good panel. So um, so let's. So the three one I felt was interesting in that. We found if you look at the amount of FEC and the um, the fact that it's one channel with less head and subcarriers, that we feel with the 256 QAM people run today with DOCSIS 3.0, DOCSIS 2.0, that you could run 1024 QAM with the same MER readings you have today. So we could get more uh, efficiency, uh, more speed. But what's interesting about 3.1 and 3.0 cohabitating is spectrum allocation. On the downstream, you're going to have to allocate spectrum for 3.0 and 3.1. They can't overlap each other. They have to have their own spectrum. Now, people might be afraid that 3.1 has to be 192 megahertz wide with all these subcarriers, but we can mute out certain sections of the 3.1 OFDM carrier and instill and sort of 3.0. So it doesn't have to be conti contiguous spectrum. Uh, I might say I only want 24 megahertz or 92 megahertz of 3.1 spectrum. Uh, and I'm going to use that just for 3.1 customers. So, I mean, the, the real question would be, why do I need 3.1? And I, I wrote down kind of a list of why 3.1 was kind of the push. And I mean, really, we have a lot of HFC plant, and we want to compete with fiber to the home. 
So we said, all right, well, for the high-end customers, business, commercial, we can cherry pick those customers with a GPON or EPON type of solution. And that's what I'm seeing some cable companies go after is an EPON, GPON. But if we want to be ubiquitous and cover the entire residential neighborhood, we're not going to rip out our entire cable plant and do GPON, EPON. We're not going to rip it out and do RFOG. Um, maybe if it's a greenfield, we could, but that's a greenfield. We have really a brownfield, right? So we have existing HFC plant that's been there for years, and we're still trying to our return on investment over 50 years. Uh, we're still trying to push that, right? We're trying to exploit that as much as possible. We're trying to get cable modem speed 10 gig down potentially and 2 gig up. But to do that, we need more efficient modulation, more efficient uh, spectrum. But then if we start talking about spectrum, now we have to change the diplex filters. Will the passes out in the field pass 1.5 gigahertz? Probably not. I think we've only seen maybe 1.25 gigahertz might be the might be the limit there. Uh, am I going to increase my upstream? If I increase my upstream, I'm eating into my downstream. So now I have to get rid of my analog channel two, three, four, five, six. Will the increased upstream spectrum interfere with existing CPE in the field? If I start transmitting a modem at 50 dBmV at 47 megahertz, will it overload my neighbor's TV set? will overload my own TV set. So there's all these little issues, power levels, attenuation with a diplex filter split. But we still, so 3.1 might get pushed to get better speeds and cherry pick still um, without doing frequency splits or any changes to my cable plant, but be able to get more efficiency. So I might be able to uh, deploy a 3.1 modem in the future and a 3.1 line card from the CMTS but I can still minimize my cost and be competitive with GPON and still competitive with Fios and Google Fiber and things of that nature. And that's sort of where I see the 3-1 coming into play. You know, and, and then, then you'll have a natural attrition, right? People moving from 3-0 to 3-1. And if that happens, then the spectrum starts, 3-1 starts eating up more spectrum. Now, on the downstream, like I said, we have to allocate spectrum for 3-0 and 3-1. Different spectrum. On the upstream, we can time division multiple access or time share the 3.1 modems and the 2.0 and 3.0 modems in the same spectrum. So I can have a 2.0, 3.0 modem burst, and then as that modem goes off, I can allocate that same spectrum for a different multiplexing scheme of OFDMA for a 3.1 modem. If you had to allocate different spectrum for 3.0 and 3.1 in the existing 5 to 42 megahertz, it would never work, right? We'd be like, ah, that's no, it's not going to happen. But because we can TDM, meaning or TDMA, TDMA, time division multiple access, we can have a 2.0 and then a 3.1 at the same spectrum but different time. That kind of solves our spectrum, our limited upstream spectrum problem. Right, and I, I think this is that's some of the, the you know the awesomeness sort of to say of of how we've always made, managed to keep uh, backwards compatibility with Doxis. Now it's it's been a lot simpler in the past with previous, you know, DOCSIS 3.0, 2.0, 1X, because we have not changed the modulation, it is getting a lot more complex with DOCSIS 3.1, because we're going to have what we call single carrier QAM, or SC QAM, which is all the QAM that we've known in the past, the 6 channel megahertz, or 8 channel, or 8... Oh, no, I, I call it legacy. legacy yeah, QAM. legacy QAM <laughs> that we really have understood, and now this, this whole new... Oh, FDM qualm is part of the, the 3.1 standard because we have to, we kind of have to switch back and forth, toggle back and forth. As you say, you know, we're going to mute some of those subcarriers and stick in the legacy qualm and then unmute them, and, and it becomes really something that's hard to visualize. I think it's going to be hard for a lot of people to visualize it until we actually get some CMTSs and cable modems out there that are 3. Dot, that support 3.1. Which uh, I mean, are you willing to to share your timelines on that or anything, John? Or is that, uh, is that <laughs> really? Like <a> <laughs> really, that would be based on the chipsets, right? So the chipsets from Broadcom and whoever else is making the three one chipsets. We're talking probably a year out. Um, so it's good that we're talking about it now because we have to. If we're going to do HFC, HFC upgrades are very cyclical. You see it like every 10 years or so, we start upgrading the cable plant, either the fiber or the passives. I'd really like to see people upgrade their passives, the splitters and the taps, not the splitters, but the taps, to cable equalized and cable simulator taps, taps that aren't flat loss. You understand what I'm saying? Yep. So, so the 23 tap we have now, like right off the first amplifier, the very first tap, 
it would be a 32 dB tap at 1 gig, but maybe 17 dB at 5 megahertz. So it's not a flat tap. This would help satisfy a lot of the problems I have right now with my designs and my upstream issues. I would be able to get modem transmit levels to be a nice tight window in my bell curve so the modem tra transmit levels were between, say, 45 and 48, really tight, not 35 to 55. So that would help me a lot. So, I mean, looking at my tap designs, my fiber nodes, with 3.1, we're also looking at remote PHY where we could put the Broadcom chipset upstream and downstream out in the field. So it's closer to the end customer. If we do that, you're running digital fiber out into the field. You no longer have laser clipping. You don't have an analog laser. It's a digital laser. So you're taking that chipset, putting it out in the field closer to the customer, and you're doing it all right there. That's called remote PHY, remote PHY layer, the physical layer. So it's an interesting concept, and um, it's going to, it's going to throw things up a little bit. It's almost like paralysis analysis. There's so much stuff coming out. People are like, well, do I do this or do I do that? Do I wait five years? Do I wait three years? Um, but we have to talk about it so people understand what are the, all the options and what kind of covers me for the next 10 years. Yeah, I mean, so, so we're talking about a lot of this stuff now because we understand that as an industry, training is absolutely critical. You know, we, we want to get ahead of the ball so that when we start deploying DOCSIS 3.1, it's not, oh my gosh, what is all this DOCSIS 3.1 stuff? And I think the point that you're bringing up right now about the return path laser is, is absolutely essential because the return path laser is historically a weak link in our DOCSIS return. So, you know, we started out with FP lasers in return, Fabry Perot lasers, and those lasers were were very very susceptible to going into a nonlinear mode, and nonlinear I mean just basically means that they they clip. So we send too much energy through them. The lasers clip. They clip some of the RF signal going through, and that results in uncorrectable code word errors. Uncorrectable code word errors to the subscriber means they get bad data. They have poor experiences with voice over IP, their data slows down, and, and this is bad. So we, as an industry, we realize, you know, these FP lasers are bad. We need to upgrade those with DFB lasers, distributed feedback lasers. They have much more dynamic range. They can take a lot more RF energy, whether that RF energy is coming from multiple bonded channels in the upstream or a lot of ingress, just crap that's coming through our upstream channel. So it's 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 a lot more it's a lot better return path laser to put in. Now the big problem, the big challenge maybe to say with DOCSIS 3.1 is we're going to have a whole lot more energy in our return. And the question is, does the DFB laser have enough dynamic range to support a really really wide channel? If we're going out to 85 megahertz and we're putting 24, 96 megahertz, 192 megahertz in the in the return, you know whatever that return is that DFB laser becomes a liability for us. And what you're talking about with a remote PHY is saying, you know what, we're going to take that analog DFB laser, remove it out of the node altogether, and we're going to put basically the return path of the CMTS into the fiber node. I mean, we're, we're just getting rid of that weak link. That's, that's basically the, the value proposition you're talking about, right? Yes, yes. I mean, you're converting it to, you're not doing baseband digital reverse, which that does usually create better MER as well, but you're actually putting a chipset in the node. So this is assuming everything on your plant now is DOCSIS. There's no uh, uh, old DAVIC set-top boxes that need their own analog signal back. It's everything will be DOCSIS because it's a digital chipset coming from the DOCSIS chip in the, mo in the node itself. Uh, but there really is no laser clipping because it's digital. It's a gig e-link potentially from the node back to the head end. And you're taking that, really it's DEPI UEPI, the downstream external PHY interface, upstream external PHY interface, communicating on a gig e-link to the node. What was interesting about that is some of the timing is calibrating in the remote PHY, even though the cable motor has to go all the way back to the CMTS. We've done some preliminary testing and we've shown potentially 2,000 kilometers away. 2,000 kilometers, so think about that. That's like halfway across the country. In theory, you could have a CMTS, packet processing CMTS on the East Coast and have remote PHY going through Metro Ethernet on the whole East Coast with these nodes 
and not have to deploy multiple CMTSs. It could be like one big CMTS and remote five nodes across the whole East Coast. So there's, there's some interesting ideas about how I might be able to change my architecture into the future and offer more uh, options, if you will. I mean, this would be probably another topic we could cover later, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, I start to get this vision of like telecoms <laughs> operators that have VSOs and and you know just two VSOs on the East Coast and everything's distributed <laughs> out from there. So yeah, it, it becomes an interesting topic to discuss. Yeah, I mean, I'll give you an example. I have a customer that's thinking about putting a CMTS in a local uh, a local site, and they have seven remote sites. And I said, well, you could put a 7225, a small pizza box CMTS in the remote sites and provide, you know, giggy connectivity out to those remote sites. But now you have to manage eight CMTSs, IP space, uh, IP allocation, and CMTS management. But if I put a remote file line card in my, my local site and run giggy from there out to my remote sites with this remote file, I still have only one CMTS. But it's kind of like I moved my line card, my Broadcom downstream and upstream chipset, out there to these remote sites, and now I have uh, IP connectivity all the way back and one CMTS to manage, not eight. It's, it's, there's some interest. I think there's a play here for MDUs and potentially hospitality at this point. And then later on, it'll be maybe bigger than that, so we'll see. Right. Okay, so closing words. If there's like uh, one big recommendation that you make to cable operators to, to that are really thinking about DOCSIS 3.1 in the near future, that you know, here's what they should start doing to to prepare for DOCSIS 3.1. What would that be, John? <laughs> um, it's not. Keep in mind, just because we went from 3.0 to 3.1, it's not a software upgrade. It's hardware. So, like we said before, it really should be called DOCSIS 4.0, but everyone said, let's call it 3.1 so people don't get scared. <laughs> let's call it 3.1 so people don't bypass 3.0 and wait for 4.0. So, let's call it 3.1. <laughs> so, 3.1 is a huge change, right? It's different multiplexing technique, more modulation profiles, uh, different channel width, big subcarriers. OFDMA multiplexing, potentially 4096 QAM uh, modulation. Um, upstream could, could be different. So there's a, there's a big change there. You have to change your cable modem, have to change your CMTS. Uh, you could still use your existing HFC plant and utilize 3.1 and 3.1 CMTS to, to talk to each other to provide higher speed. Um, I, I think the big thing is if you're going to upgrade your HFC plant, Keep in mind the frequency splits we're looking at in the future. And I almost wish Diplex filters were like FPGAs and we could <laughs> pro program them remotely. You know, I want to do a 585 split today, and then in a couple of years, I'll just FP, you know, program it remotely to do a 230 split, 5 to 230. Yeah, that's a good design project. Uh, if we could get someone right on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. RF I'll, or work on my spare, so my spare time. I'll work on my spare time. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, so you know, if I if I had one recommendation for cable operators, it would be start the training now. You know, there there are opportunities out there. You know, there are the seminars and stuff, but there's I think just so so much new technology in three one. John, like you said, it's it's not just a dot one upgrade from three. It is almost yeah. like four dot oh. So there'll be so much new technology that I think for you yeah, know definitely. especially maintenance techs all the way down, the more exposure that they start getting to DOCSIS 3.1, even if it's just through seminars and uh, embrace this in the SCTE chapters and stuff as soon as we can so that when you actually do get your first DOCSIS 3.1 deployment, it's not all completely something that no one's ever heard of and, and yeah. people start to feel comfortable with 4096 QAM and they say, okay, yeah, it is possible. You, uh, you imagine that constellation? Could you imagine that constellation? Yeah, well, I mean, I've modeled it in MATLAB. It's, it's a mess. You can't really make out the, the point. So I, I think the way we approach constellation analysis is going to change. We're, we're not going to be really able to use a, a full constellation hey, diagram. You have, to, you have to zoom in, not even on a quadrant. It'll have to be a quadrant of a quadrant. 
<laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's totally different. Yeah, so it'll be interesting. We need new test equipment. Um, the other thing is, how do you how do you estimate the capacity of this new 3.1 channel if the subcarriers are running different modulation as well? And, and they're doing that dynamically because uh, there'll be 4096 qualm if there's absolutely no impairment and you have an MER of 49 dB. But as soon as an impairment comes under one subcarrier, that subcarrier could drop to, down to 16 qualm, for instance. You could have LTE, 4, 4 gig cell phone, underneath maybe 100 subcarriers, and those 100 subcarriers have to run 256 qualm, and they change on the potential on the fly. And the rest of the qualms are clean and good MER. I mean, the subcarriers are clean, and maybe they're running 4096 qualm. Right. So, so now this big channel that you thought was worth X megabits per second is now worth less. So it's like, how do we keep track of this as well? You know, it, it'll yeah. be interesting. It's going to be very dynamic. So I, I think 3.1 is, is going to be very interesting. I can't wait to see the first CMTS and play with it. So we'll be, we'll be looking forward to it. So, all right, all right John. Well, as always, it's been a pleasure uh, talking with you about all things DOCSIS, and we won't have a call next month. We'll be at SCTE, but we will have one following the SCTE show to, to cover all the cool things that we saw there. So I look forward to seeing you at SCTE, and we'll have a call the following month. So Sounds call good. it a wrap. All Take right. care, John. All right, thanks. Bye, all. Again. all right, Bye.